Um, now, at 17 years old, we're talking three years since your grandfather passed away, you started um, playing. playing in the South Dallas scene. Mm -hmm. What's it like in, in Dallas at that time? Let's put it this way. The first gig that I did at House of Jockville with the Freddie King Jr., all the guys from Freddie King's band stayed together. Yeah. Deacon Jones, Harold Walker, and... Um, Fred Jr. was playing upside down bass. Yeah. And we had Freddie King's protege, Cookie McGee. She was probably all of 18 by then. Um, I was only a couple years older than her, maybe, because in 76, I would have been 20. Yeah. And Fred died in 76. And um, man, I played a lot of places and every weekend and it was just things happen in black clubs that don't happen in white clubs. Of course. Of course. And it's the one thing about God, there's so many stories I could tell you, but I remember the first time I played South Dallas. I was walking in with my guitar and amp and some brothers stopped me and said, where are you going, homeboy? Back when homeboy was the biggest in soul. Yep. And um, I said, I'm going in there and I'm playing. And they said, no, no, you're not. You're going to turn around and go. And I go, no, I'm playing. And they said, if you don't get back in your car, we're going to kick your ass. Yeah. I said, really? You're going to kick my ass? And they said, yeah. So I go, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to lay down and let you kick my ass. But before I lay down, I want to know why you're kicking my ass. Mm -hmm. About that time, Freddie G King Jr. shows up, who is every bit as big as his father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks just like his father. And usually wearing a cheap trick t-shirt. <laughs> you know, cheap trick, cheap trick. That's amazing. And um, he would go, what's going on? And they go, oh, we're just telling this guy. You know, and he goes... Not you, man. I'm talking about my boy here, you know, and and I made it a point after that to um, go over to Mr. King's house and, you know, after he passed and ride with Fred Jr. all the time. Or if I drove him, you know, I made sure to pick him up and it worked out real well. Sounds like a lot of education. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe it, man. I'll tell you the most hilarious story about that you don't, when I say it's like nothing you've ever seen. Yeah. Okay, just imagine this. It's about third set. Deacon Jones always told jokes. He was on the organ. He was the guy that always said, are you ready for Freddie? Are you ready for Freddie? And so he'd be telling jokes, and one night he was saying, if you're going to get married, make sure you marry an ugly woman so everybody be happy. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. And um, about that time, you heard this voice. The dance floor was totally, nobody was on it at the time. And um, basically, this woman out of the crowd said, why don't you shut up and play music? And then her and Deacon started getting it on, talking. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Deacon said something like, Woman didn't even play a cover charge and think she's in charge, you know, stuff like that. And then she would just say stuff I can't repeat. But anyway, what happened was they decided to have a dance off. So next thing you know, the woman comes out and she looks just like the mother on good times. Okay. Right? Yeah. Deacon says, start shaft. So we started playing shaft. Everything is cool. They get down there and they start dancing. And next thing you know, they're doing sort of getting closer and closer to each other, dance offing, you know, moving up and down. Next thing you know, Deacon takes his shirt off. Next thing you know, this woman that looks just like Mrs. Good Times, she takes her out and she's got a Playtex girdle on. And then he, they dance and they start acting like they're doing the doggy and all this stuff. And then 
he takes off his pants and she takes off her and she's further in the gurgle and they're getting it on and we're just sitting there playing just play shaft, shaft for 15 minutes while they did it. You don't see that. Oh my gosh. You know, I remember every time there was, was one club I played and the cool thing is Fred Jr. always brought me one of his father's guitars. But when I first, the way I got the gig is I came to sit in one night. And after I sat in, the second set came up and Fred said, where are you? Where are you? You know, get up here. And that's how I got the gig. I was with them. But they were playing through Freddie King's Quad Reverb with SROs in it, which is very heavy speaker. And they were using it for PA. And I said, Fred, if I bring a PA, can I play through your father's lamp? Well, yeah, you can. So, score. Score. Yeah. Plus, hey, this is the gold top on the cover of Freddie King Sings. <laughs> score. Yeah. But we mainly played stuff like Disco Lay, uh, Car Wash. We kept them dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, I Wish, stuff like that. Yeah. But every night on the third set, I kept on going, let's play some blues, let's play some blues. So we did Stormy Monday. Yeah. Now imagine I've been playing all the spunk stuff the whole night so that I could play my blues solo during Stormy Morning. And next thing I know, I start going, you know, like, you know, starting to get into it. Next thing I know, I had my eyes closed like I usually do. And I heard people laughing. And I'm like, I haven't even got into the solo. There's nothing to laugh at yet. But <laughs> You weren't wearing a girdle, were you? No, I All wasn't right. a girdle. Thank goodness. But the next thing I know is I open up my eyes, right? On stage in front of me is a guy that's about 6'6". Six, six, and he goes, he had a cigarette in his hand. And he goes... You got a light. So I stopped my solo, pulled out my lighter, lit a cigarette. Every time we played that club, we started Stormy Monday. And every night, I just waited for him. Instead of playing the solo, instead of going, you know, I just waited for him. I sat there with the lighter burning because he came up. So, you know, talk about things that. I don't think oh you see gosh. you don't see Did that. Did the band have to start paying this guy? <laughs> no, he was a regular, but <laughs> no, no, no. And here's the deal about also about black clubs that many people don't know. They always served greasy food. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? I didn't. Yeah. What they decided that they had greasy hamburgers, greasy chicken, greasy stuff. And what they did is they felt they could drink more, but if they ate the greasy food, mm. it would sober them up. Yeah. And sense. then they just kept drinking more. That's what I have rice for whenever I'm really? drinking. Yeah, the, the starch like soaks up the alcohol. Well. Um, rice, bread, um, french fries, potatoes. Anything. Yeah. Anything starchy. And it just... Sobers you up? I wouldn't say it sobers you up, but it makes it so you can drink more. <laughs> Maybe the, the product is called denial. <laughs> Could be. Give Absolutely. me some more denial. More. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can have yeah. some more. Yeah, let me have, a, let me have a double shot of denial. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's almost November. We might need a couple shots soon. Well, I, you know. I, don't, I don't know what that's, you know, it's. It's typical. I don't know what that's like. So yeah. we're mid seventies now, uh, mid to late seventies when you mm -hmm. when you really started getting in, in kind of immersed I was, into the scene. I started playing with Alex Moore. He yeah, was born. I, Go ahead. That was kind of like fast forward for you now because it wasn't like too long, like early eighties, that you're named a Texas Tornado. Yeah, so, I mean that's like hyper speed. Well, I was in Guitar Player Magazine in 83. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, we're talking, what, seven years? Yeah, I don't... That had to be insane, going from, you know... That one situation to the other. Yeah. I never really thought about it. I just, you know, I mean, I went from... I was playing with Fred Jr.'s band, 
Alex Moore, who was born in 1899 on yeah. piano, yeah. giving me an education. He'd stop in the middle of playing piano and go, you know, Magic Sam used to play a lick like that, but here's what he played. And then we go back into the tune. Right. But, I mean, he was he was always, when I was a kid watching KRA, they had Alex Moore, the little 15-minute spots before the next show. Mm -hmm. Alex Moore was there talking about horse, horse and buggy days and playing piano. And I was like so enamored. And when I did a session, I did a session with Ray Wiley Hubbard, Bugs Anderson, this singer, all these people. And I played on a cup with Alex. Wow. And he didn't even say boo to me. He didn't even look at me when I played Dobro on a cup. He just... I was sitting there right there, just minding my own business. Mm -hmm. And then about a few weeks later, I get a call from his manager. And he said, Alex is playing Daddy O's tonight in Fort Worth. And I said, man, that's cool. But um, I'll wait till he gets a little closer. And, and the manager goes, you don't understand. Alex says... We start at nine o'clock and he wonders why you aren't here yet. <laughs> so I, he didn't say boo to me, but all of a sudden I'm, yeah. I'm a stepchild. But he noticed. Well, I guess he did. Yeah, he must know? have. He must have. Well, let's put it this way. It was an education. Yeah. It was an education. And yeah, after that, I, you know, I, and then what's so funny is at the end of the seventies, all these people were saying, Let's play the blues. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I ain't going to play blues with white people. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know? It doesn't I'm, hit the same. Huh? It doesn't hit the same. Well. It really can. But... Well, it. And, you know, Mother Blues, you know, I was in that Mother Blues scene, and some of the guys that playing that knew that I still indulged in that. And, um, uh, the next thing you know is they all wanted to go and do blues, but that particular run from the 60s overflow into the 70s, I think that run was gone. Yeah. 